And now we take you to Evangel Church in Tallahassee, Florida, to another powerful, life-changing message. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. I invite you to take your Bibles, turn in your devices to, know, uh, to uh, Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 17, and just, uh, just a reminder that we will not meet this coming Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday night, the 27th of November, we will not have a service. We will be meeting next Sunday morning, December 1st, but we will not meet this Wednesday night. We always cancel that service to give you opportunity to prepare for Thanksgiving. Some of you I know are traveling. Some have already started traveling. Luke chapter 17 is where we're going to start. When Pastor Dale O'Shields was with us a couple of years ago, he told the story about a man named David. And somebody blessed David with a gift. He gave him a parrot. The only problem with this parrot is that it had a foul mouth. This parrot was cursing, coming and going. And David did everything he knew how to try to help this parrot clean up its vocabulary. He talked politely to the parrot. He played calm, soothing music. He did everything he knew how to do, but the parrot was just cursing like a sailor. One day, David had had a particularly difficult time at work, and he came in and was so glad to get home. And as soon as he walked in the door, the parrot began cursing David up one side and down the other. It was horrible. David says, I've had all I can take. And he opened the, qua- the cage to, the, to the, where the parrot was, and he grabbed the parrot around the neck. And he says, you're not going to do this anymore. And he opened up the freezer door, and he threw the, carrot, the parrot, in the, <laughs> threw the parrot into the freezer well, the parrot began cursing and kicking the door and ran it and raved, ra- ran it and raved for about two more minutes. Then everything got quiet. And David thought, oh, I wonder if the parrot is in trouble. I wonder if he's hurting. So he opened up the door and looked inside and there was the parrot shivering. He put out his arm and the parrot walked up on his hand and on his arm and the parrot was quiet for a minute. Then it said, David? Would you please forgive me for being so obnoxious? I'm sorry that I've cursed you. I'm sorry for all the horrible things I've had to say. Would you please forgive me? Now, David is in shock. He can't believe that the parrot is apologizing. And then the parrot cleared its parrot throat and said, David, can you tell me what did the turkey say to make you so upset? There was a, you ready for another one? Here it comes. (laughs) There was an elderly man in Phoenix. He called his son in New York City. He said, son, I hate to have to tell you this, but after 50 years, I can't take it anymore. I'm going to divorce your mom. The papers are, 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 will soon be delivered to us. I just wanted you to know, now you call your sister in Chicago. You let her know. So the boy calls his sister and he's frantic and says, what are we going to do? Mom and dad are getting a divorce after all these years. She said, they are not. Listen to me. They are not. The girl called her parents. She got her dad on the phone. She said, you are not getting a divorce. Whatever you do, you're not getting a divorce. My brother and I will be there tomorrow. You just hold on. Don't do anything till we get there. Well, she and her brother made their travel arrangements. The dad hung up the phone, looked at his wife and smiled real big, gave her a hug. She says, honey, they're going to be home for Thanksgiving and they're paying their own way. (laughs) David said, I will thank the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And we're talking about today about giving thanks. And, and I realize that it's, it's, it's popular today to rewrite history. And I know that in some schools that children are being taught that the first Thanksgiving was about the pilgrims giving thanks to the Indians for their assistance. In some places, Thanksgiving is a day where we give thanks to other people. But you know what? 
in the charters of many of the ships that brought the pilgrims to the new world. In their charter, it specifically said, when you land, you're to give thanks to God. You're to have specified days to have thanksgiving to God for protecting you. And in 1863, Abraham Lincoln, look at this. He said, the last Thursday in November will be a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwells in the heavens. Thank God for the, for, for, for the Native Americans that helped the early settlers. Thank God for the people that are wonderful in our lives. But dear ones, thanksgiving is about giving thanks to Almighty God. In 1941, U.S. Congress designated the fourth th Thursday in November as a day that America would give thanks to God. Thanksgiving is about giving thanks to the Lord. Well, here in Luke chapter 17, we've got a story about one man who came to Jesus to give thanks. It says in verse 11, it says, Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Dear ones, our God is a God of justice. He's a God of righteousness, but he's also a God of mercy, and he's a God of of compassion. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Think about that with me for a minute. Our God is the Father of mercies. He's the God of all comfort. One of the New Testament words that's translated mercy is elios. And elios means to feel compassion for someone. It goes far beyond feeling sorry for somebody. Elios makes you you not only feel what another person is feeling, but it makes you want to do something about relieving their pain. You know, I've noticed over the years as I lay hands on people, praying for people, there are times, not always, but there are times that God lets me feel a little bit of the pain, a little bit of what that other person is feeling. The Bible says Jesus was moved with compassion. And that's what it means. When you're moved with compassion, you've got this empathetic thing going on inside you where you feel what other people feel. I told you before about being in Haiti with Pastor Dale O'Shields and we were, we were on the outskirts of Port-au-Prince and the missionary that was driving the car said, let's sit here for a minute because the sun's going down. And in just a few minutes, you're going to see hundreds of young orphans that are coming. This is called the field of the orphans. This is where they gather to sleep and they pull any food that they've got. And they, 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 they need each other's body warmth to stay warm. And we watched as those little kids started coming from east and west and north and south, all across Port-au-Prince, they were coming and they began huddling together. And as we sat there, Pastor Dale O'Shield said, oh, oh. And I looked at him, I thought, what's wrong with you? And he says, I feel such compassion. I feel such hurt. I feel such pain. It's not by accident that Dale O'Shields has helped Pastor Robert Berger down in Lima, Peru to start not one, but two orphanages for hurting people. Because many times when you feel that compassion for another person, that's God's way. That's the Holy Spirit's way of telling you, I want you to be involved in this. I want you to do something to relieve and alleviate their suffering and their stress. Sometimes when I'm praying for people and I, and I just sense that, that compassion, I, I feel that Elias moving inside me. I feel that mercy moving inside me. Sometimes that's the trigger. That's the way I know the Holy Spirit wants to visit that person with a gift of the Spirit. And I'll just get quiet and just wait on the Lord because sometimes there's a word of knowledge that God will bring forth. Sometimes there's a, there's a prophetic word. Sometimes there's a gifts of healings that God wants to manifest. But that lets, lets you know, see, if you want to be led by the Holy Spirit, then, then say, God, would you help me to be a person of mercy and a person of compassion? So here these days, this guy is saying, Lord, these 10 lepers, Lord, would you be merciful to us? I think about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. 
The Bible says that Jeremiah was called even as a teenager. And God had told him, he says, he says don't be afraid of the faces of the people you prophesy to because you're going to prophesy that an invading army is going to come from the north and they're going to attack Judah and Jerusalem because Judah will not turn from their sins. And I want you to preach righteousness. I want you to preach repentance. And even if they don't turn, don't be upset. And you find the whole of his life. In fact, he's called the weeping prophet because things were so difficult for him. He was arrested time after time. In fact, one time he was arrested and placed down in a well, a dry well and yet there was mud in it and he sank up to his waist in this mud and he was left in this well for days and days and it looked like he was going to be he was going to die there and a eunuch found out about it who served in the king's house and the eunuch couldn't find any rope but he tied together pieces of old clothing and he made a rope and he put it down and and he says Jeremiah, put it under your armpits. And he raised Jeremiah out of that muddy clay. There's a psalm that says, he took me out of the miry clay. Dear ones, I'm so glad that Jesus took us out of the miry clay of sin. He took us out of the miry clay of transgression. He took us out of the miry clay of iniquity. He took us out of the miry clay of lawlessness. He took us out of the miry clay. And we used to sing a song, he took me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on a rock to stay. Hallelujah. Well, this Jeremiah At the close of his life, the Babylonians did come. The Babylonians invaded Judah. They invaded Jerusalem. And Jeremiah had prophesied. He says, God tells me that if we'll stay, he's talking to the remnant of people that were left. He says, if we'll stay in Jerusalem, we'll be safe. But there's a group of people who said, no, we need to go to Egypt where we'll find safety. And they made Jeremiah go against his will. Now, the Bible doesn't say it, but church history says that Jeremiah was placed in a cage like an animal and taken to Egypt. And that's when he wrote the book of Lamentations. If you've ever read the book of Lamentations in the Old Testament, you know it is a sad, sad story until you get to chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, because the Jeremiah says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. What do you do when somebody's taking you where you don't want to go? What do you do when life's no fun? What do you say when you feel like you've been put in a pen and are being taken to a foreign land? You just go ahead and proclaim the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Glory to God. Look at verse 14. They cried out for mercy. So when he saw them, when Jesus saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. Now, why why did they do that? It's because the priest would proclaim a person healed or or, or sick with leprosy. Go show, show yourself to the priest. Now, I love this. And so it was as they went, they were cleansed. As they went. Dear ones, obedience always produces blessing in your life. I'll say it again. Obedience will always produce blessing in your life. Disobedience will produce heartache. The Bible says, as they went, it wasn't instantaneous. There were times that Jesus spoke the word and there were miracles that took place. Understand this, miracles many times are instantaneous. It's like one minute you're sick and the next minute you're not. It's like one minute you're blind and the next minute you can see. One minute you can't hear, the next minute you can. That's what happens with a miracle. But sometimes healings, and remember this, every time you're prayed for for healing, remember that miracles are instantaneous, but healing is sometimes gradual. It's gradual, dependent on your obedience to the word of God, and you walking in the fear of the Lord. And that's apparently what happened here. The Bible says, as they went, they were healed. Glory to God. Gets me excited. (laughs) Verse 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed. Now, how many were there to start with? There's 10. But one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice, he glorified God. 
one of them saw that he was healed and returned, and with a loud voice, he glorified God. What did that sound like for this man to have a loud voice? Well, about three of you got it. Come on, what is this? What is Hallelujah. This? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. I praise you for what you've done for me. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With a loud voice, he glorified the Lord. I've got to be careful not step on these groceries. When I was about 10 or 11 years of age, late one night, I remember the, some of you don't remember this, but I remember when we only had one telephone in the house, a landline, and it was right outside my bedroom. And when it rang, it usually woke me up. And it was about midnight, the phone rang. And I heard my dad on the phone with somebody, and you could tell from the way dad was talking to him, this person was hurting, that they were in trouble and they were desperate. They said, I need you to come over to your house. I need to talk to you. I need you to pray for me, Brother Todd. And so, you know, I fell back asleep. And the next thing I know, it's about 1.30 in the morning. And I can hear Dad in the living room. And he's talking to somebody. And then he's praying with somebody. And how many of you know, when you get touched by the glory of God, when you get touched by the power of God, it makes you want to shout, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, the electricity is real, the electricity of the Holy Ghost. If you don't believe electricity is real, then you just take a paper clip and go put, your, go put it in one of these outlets. You'll find that it's real. I want you to know the electricity of the Holy Ghost is even stronger than the current that's running through this building. Well, this man began to shout, okay, so now it's almost 2 o'clock in the morning. The whole household wakes up because he is, hallelujah, glory to God. And I can hear my dad saying, shh. God's not nervous, but he's not deaf either, amen? Well, this guy's just having a good time. And he, he didn't pay my dad any, any, any mind because God had set him free. Before we knew it, the man had jumped out of our front door. And he's now in our front yard, 2 a.m. My parents live in Indian Head Acres over here in the southeast part of town. Hallelujah! Glory to God! He's running like a banshee Indian across the front yard. He runs in the next people's yard, next door, down towards Brad, Brad Smith. Wave your hands, Brad. He's down here. Brad lived one house down away from us. So now Brad, he's in that house between us in their yard. Hallelujah! Glory to God! And my dad is chasing him. Our whole house is up. What's going on? I'm sure people just thought he was drunk. Do you know they thought they were drunk on the day of Pentecost? <laughs> These are not drunk as you suppose. They're just very, very filled with the Holy Ghost. Thank God for that sweet anointing. Thank God this man comes back and with a loud voice, he glorifies God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think about King David. I, you know, Thursday we'll celebrate officially Thanksgiving, but I think every day is to be a day of thanks for believers. Psalms 103, David was having his own day of Thanksgiving. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. I want my heart and I want my lungs and I want my liver and I want my spleen. I want my, I want, I want my aorta. Come on. I, I, I want my kidneys. I want everything inside me to give God glory. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Thank God for the benefits of serving the Lord. Look at, he, he defines them, verse three, who forgives all your iniquities. He relieves you of the burden of your, of your sins. He, he erases the stain of your sins. He takes your sins and he removes them as far as the east is from the west. Come on. He forgives all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. God, I just want to thank you today that you're my healer who redeems your life from destruction. Jesus is a redeemer. We don't use the word redeem too much today. When I was a little boy, you'd go to the Winn-Dixie grocery store and they'd give you green stamps 
along with your purchase and you'd get these stamp books. How many of you remember what that's like? You'd get those stamp books and you'd, you'd fill those stamp books full of stamps and then there was a redemption center down on South Monroe Street and you could take your, your stamp books down to the redemption center and they had a catalog that was just about as good as the Sears and Roebuck catalog. They had this catalog and you could choose anything you wanted. I remember mama let me have her green stamps one time and I got me a catcher's mitt. In fact, I got a number of things with mama's green stamps. I learned what a redemption center is. Well, folks, Jesus does a whole lot more than redeem with green stamps. He'll redeem your soul from the miry clay. He'll redeem you from sin. He'll redeem you from selfishness. He'll redeem you from the powers of hell. He's the glory and he's the lifter of our head. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. Who redeems your life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. Oh, I know some people are crowned with anger and frustration, but you can be crowned with loving kindness and tender mercies. I don't know about you, but on Thanksgiving Day, I'm gonna go to this chapter and I'm gonna say, Lord, I just wanna thank you with everything that's inside me. I wanna thank you, Lord, that you're crowning me with loving kindness and with tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The older I get, the more important that becomes to me, <laughs> that my youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, sometimes, sometimes y y your mind still says that you can do things, but when you try to get your body in gear, it didn't always cooperate. Somebody asked me, I, I was playing golf with, with Tim Rice on, on Friday, and, and, and Tim said, Terrell, are you, are you playing on the church softball team? I said, well, Tim, about five years ago or so, maybe six years ago, I was playing on the church softball team, and my mind said, <laughs> my brain said, my emotions said, you know, it's not too hard on, on, on high, high arc slow pitch softball, it's not that hard to hit a double. It's not that hard to hit it over the second baseman's head or over the shortstop's head. I said, I could do that okay. The problem is that when I started to run, I'd always pull a hamstring. And man, now I'm struggling just to get to first base and I'm having to take somebody else to, having to, to run for me. I love this. Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I'll tell you, life and death are in the power of the tongue and some of us just need to speak life to our bodies and say, I thank you, Lord God, that my youth is renewed like the eagles. Glory to God. Drop down to verse 11. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. Verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Now that's an interesting metaphor. Why did David choose as far as the east is from the west? It's because if you and I go out to the airport after church and get on a plane and start flying east, we're just gonna continue to fly east. We'll fly east all the way around the globe and guess what? We'll never meet up with west. But if you and I go out in the airport and get on a plane and start flying west, we're just gonna continue to fly west around and around and around because east and west do not meet. And that's how far he's taken our transgressions and our sins and our lawless rebellion. He's taken them and he's put them in a sea of forgetfulness. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. If that's not something to be grateful for, I don't know what is. Go back with me, please, to Luke chapter 17. And let me just go ahead and add this while, while we're thinking about Psalms 103. Sometimes we don't feel like giving God glory. Sometimes our bodies and our minds and our emotions don't feel like giving God thanks. Sometimes when something horrible happens, we don't feel like giving God thanks. And yet Paul says in everything, not for everything, it's an important distinction. He says in everything, give thanks. You don't have to give thanks for the bad things. But in spite of the bad things, we give thanks because God is ultimately in charge and he's in control. Used to be that Black Friday was really special after Thanksgiving, wasn't it? Used to be that was the day to go get the bargains. But now people start their Black Friday sales online and in retail stores quite a, quite, quite a bit early. 
a number of years ago, it was on Black Friday, and Kathy and our three girls were doing what they do. They, they were at the mall. I was home. I was watching football games. When we were living in the Chicago area, when you live in a, in a major metropolitan area of 12 million people, there's always horrible things that the news is reporting. There's always people being shot. There's always traffic accidents. There's always horrible things. And they always interrupt. We interrupt this program to bring you this breaking news. And it was always about some terrible tragedy someplace. And I'm watching the football games and we interrupt this program to tell you about a horrible accident that took place in Gurney, Illinois. Well, Gurney was just 10 miles north of where we lived in Libertyville. Gurney Mills Shopping Center is there, which is a large outlet mall of about 400 stores, quite big. Right across the street was a Great America, which is like a Six Flags. They said, we interrupt this program to report that an SUV, a Ford Expedition, jumped the median, jumped the concrete median and hit a Toyota Corolla head on, killed the driver, killed one of the passengers who was a small girl. The third passenger, who was the wife, was in intensive care at St. Mary's Hospital in Waukegan. I watched that, and I thought, well, that's just, that's terrible. That's too bad. But then we're back to the football program. Fifteen minutes later, my phone rings, and I'm told that was a family in our church who was hit head on. I made my way up to the hospital in Waukegan, and it was a Catholic hospital, and they really did a good job helping people there. I walked into that emergency room and they found out I was a pastor. They just took me right in there and Kareem looked at me and it was a beautiful black family, family of four. One of their daughters weren't with them that day, but they'd gone to Gurney Mills to go shopping and they didn't do anything wrong. This other car was the one that crossed the median and hit them head on. Corinne is coming in and out of consciousness and they're telling me that she's got such swelling in her brain and they've got her bandaged up. She's still got glass all in her hair. And they say, we don't know if she's going to make it or not. Why don't you pray? So that's what I did is I prayed and Corinne would come and go and come and go. And when she'd get conscious, she'd look at me. She said, oh, pastor, they told me, they told me that Trevor, that Trevor is gone. Pastor, that can't be true. Tell me it's not true. They tell me that my daughter's gone. Tell me that's not true. What do you say in that situation? You just, just hold her hand and speak the power of the blood of Christ. And then she'd lapse into being unconscious for a while. And one time she came back into consciousness and she said, Pastor, she passed, Pastor, we had an accident. She forgot that she had already talked to me and I'd been there. She says, Pastor, we had an accident. And she says, Pastor, I'm laying in the car and there's glass everywhere. And she says, my husband, Trevor, you know, he's a handsome man. But Pastor, he was wearing a golden suit. And Pastor, he looked so handsome. And my, my little girl, my little girl had her beautiful golden outfit on. I never seen it, Pastor. I didn't buy that for her. And pastor, they came up to me and they said, Corinne, we've got to go. Pastor, and then they kind of, I saw them walking and they walked in this meadow that was full of beautiful flowers. And then she was unconscious. Finally, they gave her something to sedate her. And she did recover, thank God. Seven days later, I was standing before a congregation doing a dual funeral for Trevor and for their little girl. I'm so glad that God in his mercy gave Corinne that vision of her husband and her daughter going to heaven. Make a long story short, several years later, Corinne remarried. She married a, a fantastic man, and they're living for God. 
and they're serving his purposes and their other daughter is, is now a grown woman herself. What do you do in those situations? I mean, we've just celebrated Thanksgiving on Thursday and this happens on Black Friday. There are times, dear ones, look at me. There are times that your emotions are not going to feel like giving God glory. There are times that your, your, your mind and everything inside you is just going to feel like, God, this isn't fair, this isn't right. But the writer of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 15, I believe we've got that scripture. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 says, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. sacrifice. See, it's not a sacrifice if it's easy. It's not a sacrifice until it's costly. It's not a sacrifice until it's something that you would rather not do. Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. I don't know why that precious family was victimized that day by a woman who was on her phone and not paying attention to what she was doing. I don't understand that a bit. When I get to heaven, I hope to get some more answers. But here's what I know. I know that we serve a good God and there's a bad devil and God takes everything that the devil's meant for harm and he turns around and works it together for our good and you can't lose for winning. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. And dear ones, there are times, many times in my life, I've just had to go home and say, Lord, I don't understand things, but Father, I give you praise and I give you glory anyway. I'm going to offer you the sacrifice of praise. And it may be this Thursday, you're going to have to offer a sacrifice of praise because your emotions are not going to feel like being grateful and thankful to God. It may just be that, the you, you know, sometimes we get with family at Thanksgiving and the wonderful thing about family is they can be a great blessing or they can be a great challenge. I mean, you, most of us, we can get along for a couple of hours. But at some point in time, boy, it's just time for people to go home, isn't it? At some point in time, you know, mama's going to have a headache and Uncle Ralph is still going to be obnoxious. Come on. You know what I'm talking about? Dear ones, I've already got a made up mind. I hope I feel like giving thanks on, on Thursday, on Thanksgiving, but I've got a made up mind. I'm going to offer a sacrifice of praise, whether I feel good or not, whether I like what's going on or not, whether I've gotten a good report or not, regardless of what the economic report is and regardless of what the doctor is saying. I'm just going to give him glory and I'm going to give him praise. I'm going to give him honor in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. I think about Paul and Silas, you know, they were beaten with rods and they were put inside a, a first century Philippian sewage infested jail. There was no amnesty international to make sure that the prisoners had any rights at all. And their feet were put into the stocks. But here's what we read in Acts chapter 16, verse 22. It says, Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Dear ones, what do you do when the unthinkable happens? What have they done wrong? They had preached the Lord Jesus Christ. They saw a little girl that needed deliverance, and they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, be set free. And they cast a spirit out of her. And now they're beaten. Now they're criminals. Now their feet are at the stocks. Verse 25, but at midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. The midnight hour comes to every single one of us. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What do you do when the unthinkable happens? What do you say when you've been beaten? I suspect Silas was thinking, boy, this, this Jesus stuff isn't working. Paul, we need to go back to tent making. We need to go back to Jerusalem. But they didn't say it. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to.
to them, dear ones, people are watching us. People are listening. People are looking to see how you and I are going to respond when it's difficult. People are looking to see how we're going to respond when our hearts are breaking. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, everybody say suddenly. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, everybody say immediately. Immediately. All the doors were open and everyone's chains were loose. Dear ones, I want you to know God's got some suddenlies for you. God's got some immediately for you. (laughs) Hallelujah. Sometimes we just feel unproductive. Sometimes we feel barren. Sometimes we feel like, you know, our best just doesn't seem to be good enough. If you've ever experienced that, listen to these words of Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1. says, sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Sing, O barren, sing, sing, sing. It doesn't say sing if you can carry a tune. It doesn't sing. It doesn't say sing if Wes asks you to sing with the choir. It doesn't say sing if, if others comment on how good you are it's singing. It says, just sing, yeah. oh, Baron. There's something, dear ones, about singing at the midnight hour. There's something about giving God praise at the midnight hour. I'll tell you what it does. It creates the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. Gets active in your life. Sing, oh, Baron. You who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Don't make small plans. Don't plan, make plans to downsize. He says, enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Folks, at times we all feel like giving up. We all feel like crawling into a hole. But he says, that's not the time to do it. That's the time to sing. That's the time to make merry in your heart to the Lord. That's the time to ascribe greatness to your God. For you shall expand to the right and to the left. You shall, for your descendants will inherit the nations and make desolate cities inhabited. Do you all hear me? If you don't hear anything else, hear this. Yogi Berra, who was a great baseball player for the New York Yankees, not Yogi Bear, but Yogi <laughs> Berra, he once said, it's not over till it's over. And I'm going to tell you, your life is not over. Till it's over. Don't you dare put a period where God has put a comma. Don't you dare put a period where God has put a comma. God has made your windshield much bigger than your rearview mirror because where you're going is more important than where you've been. God wants to turn your tombstones into stepping stones. You've got a stiff arm, that despair and that hopelessness and that frustration and say, I'm crowned with loving kindness and tender mercies. Hallelujah. This man, I love it. He comes back and he gives Jesus thanks. (laughs) See, giving thanks to the Lord keeps you from taking the grace of God for granted. In the Old Testament, Every morning, the priest would get up and offer animal sacrifices, and the Levite choirs would sing about the goodness and the mercy of God. Every night, the priest would offer animal sacrifices, and the priest would sing about the goodness and the mercy of God. Why did they do that? Because they didn't want the Hebrew people taking the goodness and the mercy and the compassion of God for granted. Oh, don't get so familiar being saved that you just take the grace of God for granted. Dear ones, I want you to know it is a gift from God. We're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. Hallelujah. Don't ever forget the law of focus. The law of focus says that what you focus on will determine your destiny in life. If you focus on the goodness of God, if you focus on the mercy of God, 
that will determine your destiny. Verse 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Folks, we don't want to be one of the nine on Thanksgiving Day. We don't want to be part of the nine today. We want to give God glory and thanks. Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. See, giving thanks to God is faith in action. Giving thanks to God when nothing's going right is faith in action. Giving praise to God when you'd rather just not even be in that situation. That is faith in action. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, in the Old Testament, over in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we read about a time that King Jehoshaphat and the nation of Judah and Jerusalem were surrounded by three foreign armies, armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. What do you do when you're surrounded by enemies? What do you do? David said he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Dear ones, I want you to know depression is an enemy. Despair is an enemy. Lack is an enemy. Sickness is an enemy. Not having enough money can be an enemy. You got to say, Lord, I thank you that you're preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies. King Jehoshaphat didn't know what to do. He called a prayer meeting. He got everybody to fast and pray. And he prayed this line. I love it because he says, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I can't tell you how many times I prayed that prayer. Lord, I'm not sure. So many times during the week I paced back and forth across this sanctuary saying, Jesus, I don't know what to do. I don't know if anybody else does either. But Lord, our eyes are on you. And I'm happy to stand here today and say that Jesus has never let us down. Oh, we've been perplexed at times. We've been confused. But he has never, never not come through. He's always come through. Hallelujah. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. faithful. But you and I have got to count him faithful. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Wes, what is that song, Walking Around These Walls? I thought by now they'd fall, but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won. For you have never failed me yet, the promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. Bum, bum, bum. (laughs) Bum, bum, bum. Did you hear all these people singing? Do you know how many people should be up here in your choir? (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) Glory to God. Jehoshaphat said, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. A prophetic word came forth and said, the battle is not yours, but the battle is is the Lord's. And you remember the story. They ended up putting the choir out in front of the armies. And the choir went forth. There's three massive armies, the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. They're ready to kill them. And they put the singers out in front. But they begin to sing and praise God in the beauty of holiness. And dear ones, there's something that happens when you dare to sing and praise God in the presence of your problems. When you sing and dare to give God thanks in the presence of everything that's not going wrong, that's not going right. I'm telling you, the angels of God, the Bible says he commands his angels to have charge over you. He commands his angels. Dear ones, angels like worship. Just read the Bible. 
at the birth of Jesus, what were they doing? They were singing. There was a heavenly choir. If you want to get the angels of God involved in your life, start giving God glory. Because I guarantee you those angels are going to come through. I like the old preacher who was preaching on Acts 16 about Paul and Barnabas. And he says they began at midnight to sing and give praise to God. And God said, hush angels, I hear some worship down there in heaven. I mean on earth. And all the angels in heaven got quiet. He says, I I hear some worship. And God said, yeah, I like that. And the angels began to sing. And God began to tap his toe. And that's what caused the earthquake. Jehoshaphat, they put, the angel, they put the choir out in front and they begin to sing and praise God. And at some point in time, the very Shekinah glory of God descended and those three armies begin to fight each other. I'm telling you, God wants to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Those armies begin to fight each other. They finished each other off. The children of Israel and Judah were three days picking up all the spoils. Hallelujah. We pray right now that God uses this message to plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Evangel's all about making the name of Jesus famous and his church glorious. We love God, love people, and love life. And we're here for you, working to help draw people from impossible situations into a loving and friendly circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. We invite you to join us for any of our services, Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We're located at 2300 Old Bainbridge Road in Tallahassee. We have fantastic programs for kids and youth and small groups to make deeper connections. And we pray that God blesses you richly and abundantly as you continue to seek Him first in all of your life.